school board meeting for independent school district 624 uh would the clerk please call the roll chapman here ellison here mullen here newmaster here wilson here lloyd here would you all please stand and join me in the pledge of allegiance This time we'd like to do uh, introductions of the student representatives. Dr. Kazmichek. Thank you, Mr. Mullen, members of the board. We are pleased to welcome our new student representatives for the 2018-19 school year. They are McKenna Pratt, who's sitting up here with us. <clears throat> McKenna is a 12th grade student at South Campus. She will serve as the student representative for the 2018-19 school year. Last year, McKenna was our alternate student representative. She has been enrolled in the White Bear Lake School District since kindergarten at Willow Lane, and then I believe Sunrise, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. McKenna is involved in many activities offered at the high school, including National Honor Society, ambassadors, the math team, golf, and tennis. She is ready to learn from her peers to make the high school experience better for generations yet to come and is honored to be the student representative. Welcome, McKenna. And also with us is Madison Carroll. She's sitting out front there. She's an 11th grade student at South Campus. She will serve as the alternate student representative for the 2018-19 school year. She participates in ambassadors and student council, and she plays varsity soccer and gymnastics. Madison started attending White Bear in sixth grade Previously, she attended St. Pius Catholic School in White Bear Lake. She looks forward to being the alternate student representative and the opportunities for growth that it will hold. Welcome, Madison. Welcome, both of you. Okay, before us, we have an agenda, and I would ask for approval of the, of, uh, the agenda. So moved. A motion for Mr. Chapman. Is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Wilson. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please put, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, we have before us an agenda. We also have before us a consent agenda, which is the, a sundry of items that we typically go through, um, including uh, payroll and uh, gifts to the district. And we are very fortunate to have a, um, that our community is so generous in, in their givings. Uh, this month uh, is, uh, very fortunate, excuse me one second. We have uh, several backpacks that were given, uh, several donations that were given to the wrestling team, the football team. Um, thank the community for, for their generosity uh, to our district. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. A motion by Ms. Allison, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Beloy. This will require a roll call vote. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Lloyd? Aye. Okay, we, uh, we have uh, all eyes. We have a, a consent agenda. At this point, we have uh, is our public forum, and uh, typically we ask that anybody willing, uh, wanting to, from the public, w wanting to speak to the board, uh, please fill out a white card, which are located on the table over there. I do not see any white cards up here on the dais. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to our first informational item, which is C1, which is the opening school report. Dr. Kazmierczak. All right, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. I'd like to uh, welcome Sarah Paul up to kick this off. We have leader members of our leadership team highlighting um, in their particular area of oversight uh, all the great things that are happening as we kick off this 2018-19 school year. All right, Chair Mullen, Dr. Kazmichek, Ms. Pratt, and members of the board. Um, I'm excited to kick off this opening school report. As we all know, the first days of school are really critical for establishing a culture of learning. <coughs> and having a sense of community motivates students to participate and engage 
while feeling safe to grow and learn both individually and collectively. Here in White Bear Lake Area Schools, we don't just hope that relationships and community, ability is gonna, community building is gonna happen. We really put our resources and energy into ensuring that it happens. Um, so I'm just excited to share this update and if you could just listen for those two things about how across all age levels we're really supporting relationship building and um, enhancing learning communities right off the bat before school even starts. Um, at the elementary level, we, um, before the first day of school officially begins, our schools are hosting two days of welcome back conferences for students in grades one through five. Um, this is an opportunity for each teacher, parent or guardian, and student to form relationships and acquaint them with the classroom. Um, in addition, school staff provide significant logistical supports and so that families um, can provide, um, get information for online annual updates, um, do their lunch account deposits, and this year we did our back to school pictures, which was a big success um, with our parents to be able to help with their children preparing for their pictures. Kindergartners get their own orientation experience before school starts, and all of our students and families feel part of the school even before the first day of school begins. In middle schools, um, we really are um, prioritizing supports in two ways. We have web, um, where, um, where everybody belongs, programming for students before school starts, as well as um, opportunities throughout the school year for students to participate in, um, in homeroom or in an advisory model in which both social, emotional, and um, learning um, and academic supports are just part of the everyday experience for students in middle school. Um, in the high school, um, we've got back to school information night for parents um, upcoming this week at North Campus on Thursday will be their parent information night. South Campus has already took place. And in addition, um, Link Crew happens in which um, our high school students are providing mentorship to um, incoming ninth graders, which is a really important opportunity to help students feel connected right as ninth grade begins. And then those supports continue throughout the year. Um, one additional thing I wanted to mention is that we also have cultural um, specific um, activities in place. We had our first Native American um, open back to school um, night for our Native American families, which was a huge success, as well as um, specific supports for our Latino families that needed some additional um, interpretation supports. And then we have two additional cultural liaisons that we are, have hired this year, or in the process of finaling one of those hires um, to continue those supports for families that have some specific um, needs um, for language needs throughout the year. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to um, our next person from operations. Good evening, Chair, Mem <coughs> Chair, Mullen, <coughs> Chair Mullen, members of the board, Dr. Kasbercheck. Uh, the beginning of the school year is a really busy time for the operations department. The summer is a really busy time for the operations department, but we've had a great start to the school year. And with us today, we have our coordinators. We'll start with Dan Rozier in facilities, followed by Bridget Lane in nutrition, and then Mike Torito, transportation. So welcome, Dan Rozier. Welcome, Mr. Rozier. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was a busy summer for buildings and grounds. Um, I want to highlight a couple of our bigger projects. The photo on the right, or on the top, is the uh, Normandy Senior Center parking lot, which was totally repaved, restriped. We took care of some drainage issues over there and funneled everything into a newly uh, formed rain garden. So that was an exciting project for us. We do still have some LED lighting that's coming sometime later in September, so right now, there's just some temporary lights in the parking lot and uh, that'll be switched over to LED lighting by the end of the month. Photo on the bottom is our North Campus Central Tennis Courts. I am happy to say that six of the courts are up and running as of last Friday. There's been a slight delay in uh, the post coming. Uh, they're in the mail. We're told they're gonna be here this week and we should have all courts online by the end of this week. So. Another huge improvement for us. The, the old courts were in pretty rough shape. And thanks to our LTFM bond money, which went to the board back in February when it was approved, we were able to complete these projects. There was also about 100 smaller projects we completed, ranging from roofing, painting, um, windows, um, security, flooring, lighting, all kinds of little things that were created to improve our schools. I think we, once again, we touched a little bit at every school to make some improvements, so we're really proud about that. 
And this time of year, I always take, take a minute to thank our custodial crews, our maintenance crews, our grounds crews. Super busy summer for them. Our buildings are very busy in the summer besides the construction project, all the cleaning that needs to take place. We still do quite a bit of programming and our uh, custodians, maintenance people just did a fantastic job getting the buildings ready again. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Bridget with Nutrition Services. Uh, again, this year we have new offerings with the local foods. We are partnering, actually further expanding our partnership with The Good Acre, uh, who works with various local farms throughout the state and Wisconsin for uh, some fun local products. I have a rainbow theme going here. I, we have rainbow cauliflower and rainbow carrots coming locally this year. Uh, also, delicata squash was very popular last year. Uh, we're adding on parsnips and uh, giving watermelon radishes another try for some of the <laughs> new and exciting things. Uh, we also purchased some new equipment. You'll see a new dish machine. That one's at South Campus. We also have a brand new one at Vadness Heights. And the smaller picture right next to it is a Roboku, which is a food processing machine. Uh, we have four of those, which is why we're able to expand those local foods. So uh, they're now uh, slicing all their own carrots and not doing baby carrots at the high schools. They'll be slicing uh, all their uh, broccoli, cauliflower, and anything like that, so we won't be buying in quite as much processed food that way. Uh, we'll be doing it on site. And then we also expanded our second chance breakfast, so it was very successful at North Campus last year, so both uh, South Campus and ALC are doing a breakfast after uh, first period this year. And then lastly, we did, we were able to hire in April a menu specialist, so we now have someone in our department uh, who has a bit of a nutrition background as well as she's a trained chef. So looking forward to have her starting up this year, working on some fun new recipes. Thank you. Good evening. So I decided to start this year off with uh, new equipment. We added about three new buses to the fleet compared to uh, four last year. Our fleet continues to get better and improved. We spent about $350,000 though in parts, which when we calculated it out with the mileage, it's about 50 cents a mile to operate as far as parts goes throughout the fleet. Um, we did do 1.7 million miles this school year, last school year. Uh, we anticipate it to be about the same uh, this year as we have about the same amount of routes. Um, other than that, our special needs and special ed programs, and with the addition of uh, some Normandy Park kids, we're experiencing many challenges with all the different program times, but we're making it through the first week of school. So with that, that's it. Thank you. Good evening, <clears throat> Chair Mull Chairman Mullen, members of the school board, Dr. Kashmircheck. We had an exciting summer that started with extended school year, or what we call ESY this summer. ESY is designed to uh, provide specialized instruction to exceptional learners over the summer so that they don't lose the skills that they learn during the school year. We served over 170 students pre-K through age 21 at three different sites, including Otter Lake, Birch Lake, and South Campus. Some activities that we had in addition to the academic instruction were social skills, life skills, and on-site field trips. One of the field trips that we had was our partnership with the Ramsey County Deputy, Mary Bergstrom, and she came and she talked about safety, community helpers, and different ways that the law, law enforcement keeps our community safe. In addition, our special education teachers went to a training at Northeast Metro 916 called Structured Teach. And Structured Teach is such a great training, it's research-based, and it teaches our staff how to implement different types of routines and structures into their school days so that our students can experience success in their least restrictive environment. And so we had our teachers that went for a couple days and then our paras, and then they came together to learn how to implement that into our classrooms. And the really great thing about this is that Northeast Metro 916 will provide ongoing support throughout the school year so that we'll really be able to implement that with fidelity. The last thing that we did is we invited all our paraprofessionals to um, participate in PACER, which is our Minnesota advocacy group. 
They have an annual symposium, and this summer they presented on mental health, and so our pairs were all invited to attend that, and they learned different strategies on how to support students who are experiencing stress and anxiety, and they're able to take those different strategies and implement them into the classroom. And people that participated shared that it was really a valuable experience to them and that they were able to partner with each other and really talk about the different um, ways that this could impact their work during the school year. Thank you. Mr. Garrison, if we can hold, I know that a couple board members had some questions. If you don't mind, can we just back up a little bit? And then I know that this and then also um, operations, if we could just get some questions out there, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Wilson? Yeah, mine are for the operations crew. Uh, actually, all three of you, but Mike already answered mine in writing, so thank you for that response, Mike. Uh, Dan? Did we have a chance to work in rain gardens with the Normandy parking lot? Construct any rain gardens in the Normandy parking lot? Yes, we did. Oh. Yep. Over on the north side of the parking lot is a new rain garden. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Good thinking. Yeah. And Bridget, you don't need to get up for this. Um, I'm rather, my curiosity is piqued by some of the new nutritional offerings. <laughs> is there a cash account? Say if I, you know, anyone wanted to come by and just pay cash oh, to absolutely. sample some of it? You can come by and have a meal for $4, or you can come buy some watermelon radishes for 80 cents. That and <laughs> car carrots, and I love parsnips. Oh, I absolutely and parsnips, love parsnips. Most of the, <clears throat> the root vegetables, so your radishes, your par parsnips, we do a nice roast on them, so they're pretty okay. good. Some Thank have you. a honey glaze. Thanks. Any other questions up to this point? Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Garrison. Thank you for waiting. Members of the board, <laughs> we were just joking that you could get, uh, you could also pick things out of the rain gardens for free if the eight cents is too much. <laughs> Watermelon <laughs> radishes. Yeah, that's right, I know, I love that stuff. Uh, one of the big things that happened in technology this summer was that our new phone system, which you voted on last uh, spring, uh, this is a long overdue upgrade for us, and we're really excited to have it in place. Um, the, uh, Pat Suko did a ton of work with our vendor in getting things up and running. The kind of the baseline report is we have working phones in all learning spaces and in all offices throughout the district. We're still working on some of the final details of this implementation, um, just because things take time. But uh, but uh, the phone system's working great, so thanks for that. Uh, one of the most exciting things about our office in the summer is that our workforce really flips and becomes very student focused. One of our amazing tier one technicians, Cheryl Lanigan, worked uh, with our students this summer to make sure that they had a really solid work experience and were both doing productive work for us in technology and gaining on the job skills that are part of our college and career readiness. So it's really fun. We had 21 students who worked for us on and off throughout the summer, um, but you know that really a core group of students that, that tend to do most of the work. Uh, as you can see from the bottom part of this picture, a lot of our summer work involves cardboard management because, um, because computers come in cardboard boxes. But we also have um, students who did all of our enrollment. And, um, and I'll just share with you that uh, just because of some international things that happened. A lot of the Chromebooks that we had ordered um, in June didn't actually come until August. And because of that, uh, the, the head for um, the head of sales for Acer, who's our company that supplies those, and our local sales rep came to meet with us just to kind of explain why that had happened and, and to kind of talk us through the, the upcoming process. While they were there, they saw one of our students who was working alone in a room surrounded by a couple hundred um, Chromebooks that uh, she was enrolling, and they were just incredibly impressed that, that any one person was doing this, let alone um, a, a White Bear 10th grade student. So that was really exciting to see, and, and great kudos from them. Uh, those 21 workers enrolled the 200 tablets that we bought this year, the 120 desktops. Uh, they did all the deployment, all the classroom deployment of the 1,000 uh, plus phones. Uh, we got 2,200 new Chromebooks this year. This was a large buy year for us because we switched our, um, our high school uh, deployment to a four-year deployment. So we had to buy one extra year this year to kind of get on that longer scale. Um, and then they cleaned up all the old Chromebooks. So that was, that was uh, great, uh, great work. And uh, in terms of the rest of our team, a lot of just clean up when things are happening, out, um, when teachers aren't here, including adding 30 classroom displays throughout the district. 
Uh, once August came around, we uh, held our local or our annual innovation camp. Uh, about 75 teachers signed up to participate in this um, voluntary training. They are in CEUs, and it was really, really, really engaging day. We tried to condense it into the shortest time as possible, but had about 20 different offerings for people um, over the course of the half a day. So that was really that was really fun to see. Our focus for that. Uh, was um, really the focus for our year this year, which is around um, providing good tools and the support needed to make them work well, the skill sets uh, to, to really drive student learning, and then the mindset uh, that we have talked about around student agency that's really at the center of our strategic plan. So we're really excited about that as a focus for the innovation camp and, and for our work this year. And um, finally, um, the, the other part of my innovation work involves the Big Sleuth. Voting will open for the Big Sleuth on October 1st. And between now and then, a team of us are going around to every building and department uh, to make sure that everyone knows how to submit an idea when they have one. We're looking for staff to submit ideas about um, how we can improve on the greatness that is White Bear Lake Area Schools. Thank you, Mr. Garrison. Mm -hmm. Ms. Newmaster. Mr. Garrison, can you ask? I just have. One picky old media specialist question. When you say you're enrolling Chromebooks, does that mean you're putting them on Destiny? No. Um, you picked a different way to keep track of them? No, um, not that kind of enrollment. We just, um, but although um, we, do, we do check them out, but we don't check them out via Destiny at this time, although we, we may at some time, we've certainly talked about that possibility. When we enroll them, we just enroll them into our ISD 624 domain so that we can manage them. Um, that allows us to control down to the user level how much access a student has and, uh, and also allows us to freeze a device if it disappears or if, um, or if it's not turned in on time, then we can just freeze that device so it's no longer usable. So you're no longer keeping track and checking them in and out on Destiny to we, students? We don't check out Chromebooks via Destiny at this time because we have a separate management system that's tied to the, all that other system I just right. described for that. Um, we use Destiny for a lot of other things that are super mm -hmm. valuable. So. Oh, I know. Mm -hmm. But I was just curious, when did you switch to this new program last year? I can get back to you on exactly when oh, we I switched to that. But oh, yeah, for, for the last couple of years, I think we've been, we've been using this route there. They changed the, the management console, the kind of the admin side of how you manage Chromebooks, mm -hmm. and just made that a lot more user friendly. And okay. so that's been working real just well for wondered. us. Yeah, thank you. Any, but any other questions regarding technology? All right, thank you, Mr. Garrison. Thank you. Next, we will move to human resources. Thank you, uh, afternoon. Uh, Chairman Mullen, uh, board, Dr. Kasmichak. I'll give you an update on uh, what we'll be doing in uh, HR. Um, the uh, Skyward User Group, this is a uh, kind of initiative that initially started out with looking at how we can uh, help the HR staff better uh, improve the skills in the use of uh, the Skyward uh, system. Um, but it, then it, it kind of uh, morphed into a bigger initiative where we looked at um, expanding it to other school districts and who had, who would use the same system. Uh, and to look at creating a user group, uh, people learn better when they have uh, people who are, are like-minded and can share ideas that are similar. And so uh, we opened this up to, actually sent out a survey initially and ask other districts um, what they thought about the start of a Skyward user group uh, to bring people together to learn about how to improve their knowledge in the system. Uh, it was overwhelming that a lot of districts wanted to uh, engage in this kind of a, of a, um, of a uh, initiative uh, because the Skyward itself doesn't have, really have a, a user group uh, that can support uh, the, the end user of the product. And so that was the, um, the impetus for the creation of a Skyward user group which was born and bred right here at, at White Bear. We pushed the initiative. Uh, we set the uh, goals and, and, and ambition and objectives for the group, uh, created the mission uh, statement for the group. Uh, it got voted on and was approved by uh, the members that attended the first meeting. The first meeting we, we had, we had about uh, eight school districts that attended the initial uh, meeting, which I was the uh, facilitator of. And uh, they loved the idea, and uh, we continued to come together as a group. Uh, we, it's monthly. I was a facilitator for the first uh, three months of this group. And then uh, uh, Chris Hain, the uh, facilitator for MNASPA, uh, then uh, came in and I turned it over to him because I don't really use the system a lot, but it was really, again, designed for, for uh, my team to be, to, to be able to engage in, uh, with people who also use the system as they do. 
And now it's just about 16 school districts that are uh, part of the Skyward User Group that meets uh, monthly, and it is, is uh, designed to float around to, to each school district as it rotates uh, and who, uh, who um, hosts uh, the, the user group. And uh, my group has found it very useful to attend uh, this, this meeting and to engage, again, in conversation with people who use the system as well as they do. Uh, that kind of also goes into the cross-training uh, of staff. It's something that, that um, this was, was, was pushed as an initiative for uh, uh, allowing for continuity of services when somebody can't uh, be present. And uh, we've engaged in cross-training for like things like FMLA, uh, student enrollment, or staff enrollment, uh, benefit enrollment, those kind of things. I, I even attended the, uh, the benefit enrollment and learned the ins and outs of how to do benefit enrollment and also went through some examples of how to do that. So it was a, a, a nice engagement for the HR group, uh, group to, to do. Uh, as you know, contract negotiation is this, it's a year uh, for that. Uh, and these are the groups that we've uh, either settled with and complete it, or we have tenant agreements for uh, groups. Uh, transportation drivers and custodial are the two groups that we uh, have tentative agreements for and working on. Uh, they have the two contracts for uh, discussion and voting on, and then they'll come back to us for a final uh, board, board approval. Uh, but as you know, contract uh, bargaining agreements is something that drives kind of how we operate, expectations for uh, what we expect to do, uh, and, and to be alignment with. Uh, with um, the language within the contract. So it kind of is a guiding principle for how we operate and how employees operate uh, based on those bargaining agreement. Um, so these are the ones that we settle or have tentative agreements for now currently. And then staffing, of course that's a big part of HR is, is engaging in staffing. These are the uh, groups that we've uh, been hard, hard at work uh, bringing on board. These are all new employees. And these are individuals that are benefit eligible, 0.5 or higher, uh, that can work for us. Um, and as you can see, uh, the demographic makeup, uh, that's about, I think, seven out of 95 that are uh, staff of color. That's about 0.07%. So still got some work to do for creating more diversity within the, the district. But uh, these are the, are the numbers in the makeup of the individuals that we hired uh, for this year. So it's 95 total, and um, that's what we got. Any questions? Any questions regarding human resource portion? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Community services. Welcome, Mr. Maurer. Oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Chair Mullen, members of the board, Dr. Kazmichek. Um, looking to highlight some uh, good things around our department from starting from last spring over the summer and leading up into the fall here. Um, as uh, Mr. Rozier um, said earlier uh, in his uh, presentation, they updated our pickleball courts as part of the tennis courts over at South Campus, which makes our adult population that participate in those very, very happy. They're very excited to see those. Um, last year in the spring, you'll see the notice the picture there. We do from our Bear Power events throughout the year, we had a new high of participation. We had 352 participants in our breakaway bike uh, ride event over at Otter Lake um, over the summer. That's, of course, one of our, well, our probably our busiest time of the year with all of our uh, recreation sports, summer youth activities. Um, we had, um, within our scheduling department, we had 925 scheduled baseball and softball games throughout the community with zero uh, conflicts, which is a, just a great testament to the detailed work that John Anderson and others in my department put uh, forward without planning and scheduling fields. Um, and then upcoming here at the uh, end of this fall and winter as we get ready for the winter season, our hippodrome, hippodrome upgrades will continue for their um, energy um, reduction plan. They're putting in some new LED fixtures and a refrigeration head pressure control for the um, uh, temperature control in the Hippodrome. Um, adult enrichment, um, another thing that uh, Mr. Rozier mentioned with the movement of, or the construction of the parking lot, Normandy Park displaced some of our programs. Um, so we, uh, our senior center program got moved to Matoska Elementary for the summer. Um, again, just a testament to the strong communication between the departments um, transition over there and back went well. We didn't miss a beat. Meals on Wheels went off without a hitch. Uh, just great communication between Dan and his staff and uh, Tara and our staff over at uh, the Senior Center with Normandy Park. Um, uh, you've probably all received them in your homes already, but um, our new fall catalog came out a couple weeks ago. So just a reminder to take advantage of our uh, variety of enrichment opportunities and community events. Um, you'll notice too, uh, just have a picture up there for the Senior Voice. Um, we have a new look to our senior voice that we do four or five 
uh, senior uh, voice publications each year too. So just a, a nice array of events and activities for our senior group uh, population to take part in during the school year. And uh, just some upcoming events, our Senior Center Open House is on the 18th of uh, September, coming up here uh, from 9 to 11. So if you're available, uh, I, suggest, I would recommend uh, go checking out the Senior Center. Usually have plenty of pastries on hand and uh, stuff that, coffee and water and lemonade, things to drink. Uh, and then last year's success uh, around our community conversation around the book, The Good Time for the Truth, has sparked a lot of interest in our community for similar events. Um, so this year, in collaboration with the City of White Bear Lake, the Matamidi Community Education, uh, Greater White Bear Lake Area Foundation, um, and the uh, White Bear Lake Historical Society, we're bringing you the Many Faces of White Bear Lake. It's going to be a community series or a community event, uh, but a <laughs> series of events in collaboration with those other partners, uh, events honoring the, the legacy of White Bear Lake. Uh, then youth enrichment and youth recreation, the, just the common theme here is uh, increased enrollment. We've seen uh, last year, we saw a 48% increase in youth enrichment participation. Um, do a lot, a lot of great work collaborating with our, inside our department to uh, build out the success of what other people are, are doing within our groups, uh, making sure that these programs are getting out to kids and they have opportunities to participate in uh, all the wonderful programs we have going on. So those numbers are just fantastic. Um, a concentrated effort and joint collaboration with our out-of-school time and our youth enrichment to partner uh, with camps and clubs, giving the kids that participate in extended day uh, opportunities to also participate in these clubs if they're happening at the same time. Uh, and some key initiatives for Tracy and youth enrichment this year are going to be um, some middle school leadership opportunities and then continue to expand our youth enrichment um, offerings. And just some great numbers for youth recreation. Over the summer, uh, for the course of the year, we, I mean, we had 3,000 participants in our, in all, throughout all of our programs. And when you include the, um, the student employment opportunities that Matt offers through our rec sports, along with our community volunteers, uh, we, have, we, we have over 4,000 people that participate to support these programs for our kids. So we're very lucky to have uh, that support throughout, that community, uh, throughout our community. Um, if you're around the schools today, our early learning, our early learner preschoolers all started today to have their first day of school. Uh, again, the continued theme of increased enrollment. Uh, so this number here, the, the 294, is strictly just our early childhood uh, programs. It does not include um, our uh, ECFE numbers, but I have those here as well if you have questions on those. Uh, so currently, as of last week when we pulled numbers, we had 294 students registered for our uh, early childhood programs. Uh, I should also point out it doesn't, this, this number does not include uh, early childhood special ed, too. Those would be different numbers. Um, so we've seen an increase of an additional 25 kids from this time last year, and we will continue to um, take kids throughout the year. So uh, numbers are up. Um, we've expanded our School Readiness Plus program to Badness Heights. We got approval from MDE um, from our expansion um, application. Yeah, we'll be continuing our work with our Pre-K to 3 initiative work. Um, we've added an additional um, outdoor family adventure class on Saturdays at our Tamarack Nature Center. Um, and throughout our summer outreach, um, we have a, a wonderful group of people that go around the community to uh, showcase what we do in early childhood and try to attract families and recruit to let them know that our programs are here. Um, we had nine new additional families um, that joined up in our programs this year. Uh, just some important dates, our screening starts uh, this week on the 14th. Uh, and I think right now, currently all of our sections are booked through the middle of November, beginning of November. So uh, we are busy, busy. And uh, the, our, our early childhood PTA, their costume party is on October 25th at six o'clock at Normandy Park if you care to uh, dress up and stop by. <laughs> costume is not mandatory. <laughs> so. Uh, and finally, our out-of-school time programs, it's a, uh, the, the theme continues, our numbers continue to go up. Um, we have currently, as you can see on the numbers here, um, our, it's not, uh, sorry, where am I at here? So the numbers in parentheses for our extended day and flex numbers are currently waitlisted. So we have uh, almost 100, we have 144 kids waitlisted for our programs. We will continue to bring those kids in as our um, staffing numbers go up so we can keep our ratios. So if you, I think I've mentioned this in other previous board meetings as well, if you have any uh, just wonderful people that would like to work in our great programs to serve our kids, we're always looking for qualified people to serve as aides and assistants in our programs. Um, and we'll be doing some work um, with HR and um, some work with Lisa Orn uh, to do kind of a uh, HR kind of recruitment events and we have some other job fairs coming up so we're hoping to recruit some people from there too. Um, targeted services continues to expand with opportunities across all, all elementary schools this year. Um, and one thing we've, we've really like to highlight, we provided uh, just over $11,000 in scholarships to families last year between uh, October of last year through August. 
Um, and currently have 15 families registered to receive scholarships this fall. So we do our best to make sure that we are able to get as many kids as we can through our program and offer assistance whenever we can. Um, our middle school flex program uh, also started up uh, with school. Uh, and again, it's, uh, we're just really excited to be able to offer this for free for middle schoolers after school this year. Um, our targeted services session begins on October 15th and we have our first Friday Night Live event at Central Middle School on the 28th. Thank you. Any questions regarding the community service? Ms. Beloy. Hmm. How did we, why did we move the flex program from paid last year to, to non-paid this year? Last year, um, so we started the flex program during the school. So the, in the, during the summertime, uh, we do charge a fee for that because the, the hours are obviously a lot longer. Um, last year in the fall, we did start with a fee. Um, and a, I think right around the middle of the year, we actually, our numbers were up and then they went down a little bit and we just, we really wanted to make sure that kids got an opportunity to come in. And so we decided to, to waive the fee starting like right after the first of the year, I think February. And we continued to run that through. Our numbers went up, we had kids there. That was our main goal is to get kids there after school to make sure that they have a, a place to um, participate and place to, to be after school instead of you know, either sitting at home or um, not having a place to go, so. So how does that differ with the extended day? Is the extended day go to later? Because I know flex ends at five. Does extended yep. day so go? Extended day um, is before and after school and they go till six. Our flex program is after school from <laughs> three to 5.30. Um, this also gives that kid, the our, our students that participate and have the opportunity to, to use the activity bus for transportation. And do those two groups co-mingle with each other? Like at Central and Sunrise and? Um, do, um, sometimes in the summer we'll do some events, but since it's all building based, so Central Sunrise, everybody you typically I mean stays within the, the building, sorry. Within like Central Middle School, would the Flex kids and the Extended Day kids be working with the same groups of people or? Uh, similar staff. We do have some staff that cross over, but the kids are, they stay in their buildings. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Mr. Chairman, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering where the pickleball courts are. Pickleball courts are on the ten are they are on the tennis courts. Ooh. So there's a different light shaded blue line on there that you know signifies what I'm talking our about pickleball board, dimensions. Beloved board member, has he been in contact with you about you I'm know, sure he will. He has. <laughs> yeah. Has he? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I point Thank out you. one? I'm going to point out one more thing, Tim. Uh, you had highlighted Badness Heights for SR Plus, School Readiness Plus. Yep. And then we just got word that um, Birch Lake has been funded as well for an additional section and um, expanding our preschool opportunities there. We just got word in the last few days on that. So yeah. even further expansion since mm -hmm. this was created. So, yep. yeah. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Right, and I will Patience. Welcome. hi there, uh, Chair Mullen and members of the school board. I'll finish up here with basically a virtual or an electronic uh, show and tell on some of the ways that we've been getting ready for school and some new things that we'll be doing in the communications office. And so as we prepare for the school year, a lot of this you've seen before. Of course, you saw a new version this fall, but we worked on our activities calendar that was is always very well received and very popular and, and sought after starting at about June 10th. People start calling and saying, where is my activities calendar for next fall? Um, we also worked on the student planners for both middle school and high school. Uh, worked on our beginning of the year letters that were mailed out to families from Dr. Kazmierczak's office, and that was uh, mailed both in English and in Spanish. And then again, uh, worked on translations. The, the calendar had the translations included, and then as well as the back to school, um, or uh, back to school letters. Uh, convocation event, uh, many of you were there. Thank you for joining us for that. And it was a really nice kickoff for our staff members to get together to start the school year right and then to learn about some of the really important initiatives that are happening this year. And then our Back to School Bears Facebook challenge, we are in the midst of the voting phase of that now. So at the end of the week, uh, one lucky student or community member or staff member, whoever ends up winning, uh, based on the likes that we have in that Facebook album, will be delivered. Um, but Bear will be delivering ice cream. And I've been thinking maybe we should switch to parsnips now that I, I hear we've got such great things in our cafeterias. But um, I think we're sticking with ice cream for now. 
Um, other than that, some of the new initiatives that we have com coming up for this year, um, additional translation projects. This kicked off actually last spring. We worked um, with Brianna and, uh, and worked with some surveying of our Spanish-speaking families and trying to figure out how best to communicate and to support um, families who are Spanish-speaking. So some of the things that we learned last spring we'll be implementing this, this fall and throughout the school year. Uh, we're working on gaining some in additional information about a potential or a, a website redesign, tweaking um, some of the ways that we reach out to families, community members, students, staff members, and with our online presence, our Parent Leaders Network, which was formerly known as our um, Parent Leaders Forum. We're doing things a little bit differently, switching up the timeline and switching up the schedule for that, and uh, we're, we're hoping to see some really good engagement with our parent leaders in that way and then additional engagement efforts that are related to the strategic plan. And then you will be hearing from the, from the district and from our department um, more updates throughout the year on strategic planning, comprehensive facilities planning, and then safety and security initiatives as well. So in addition to everything that we're always sharing, those three umbrellas will be um, very well covered throughout this school year. And so other than that, um, welcome to the academic year, and I'm open for any questions you may have. Any questions regarding the communication portion or anything? All right. I, for, I know for me, I want to thank you all for the work that you're doing. I'm excited about the, the school year. I think that everything is going off great and hearing a lot of positive feedback from a lot of parents out there. So thank you all for your work, and um, go Bears. Any other questions regarding the update? All right. So now we will move on to C2. Um, we are very fortunate in, in this community, in this school district, to have an education foundation such as great as ours. And um, now we would get an update from the White Bear Lake Area Education Foundation. Um, thank you both for your work. I'm going to say that. I really appreciate uh, this organization. So thank you very much. And welcome. Thank you, thank you. I'm Connie Manny, and I'm the chair of the foundation this year. With me is Don, come on, Don Hank. Um, we're gonna kind of uh, give you an overview of what the foundation does, and uh, primarily just share a little bit of background about what we do. We are a partner with the school district and the broader school. And we have a number of grants that we give throughout the school year. Most of them are dedicated to the faculty and the, and the um, classroom needs, but then we also have a couple of vehicles to direct specifically to student needs. So I'm going to talk about the first part of that, and then Dawn's going to talk about the second half. <clears throat> and I thought we'd just, or I'd just share a, a little bit about each of the grants, talk a little bit about what they target, and then how much we gave away last year. So one of the grants is the Ryan Family Elementary Art Grant, and that we give to um, teams or teachers for art supplies. And last year we gave about $4,300 away. So we have a very generous donor that basically anyone who applies uh, is uh, granted their, their wish, which is really cool. One of our biggest grants is the Brocious Teaching Grant. And that's really designed to enhance the rigor of their curriculum or instruction within the classroom. Last year we gave about $30,000 away to classroom <coughs> grants. <clears throat> Another big grant of ours is the Glassroot Family Foundation Fellowship. Uh, and that is for professional and personal growth. So teachers uh, apply for that. Last year we gave about 12500 a lot of teachers use that to attend um, special once-in-a-lifetime kind of events. Uh, they go internationally in some cases. Many of them attend conferences and it really enhance their, uh, their areas of interest and, and their teaching abilities through that. And then we also have the E3 grant, which last year we gave about $18,500 away. And that was for environmental learning opportunities. And uh, some of the schools also use that for camps, environmental camps. We have a couple of scholarships uh, that 
are funded through us. Um, we also have a Lynn Milkey Distinguished Educator Award that we give away, and uh, so a number of other awards and funds we give away. All in total, last year we gave away about $131,000, all to benefit the school. So Dawn? Just briefly, I wanted to tell you about a couple other things. You can hear that we're doing really good things, $130,000 awesome work but we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you about our closet and that's located at the ALC building and it is open to all of our district students and their families people can make an appointment at the closet to shop for <coughs> new and, and gently used clothing by appointment we have 30 volunteers who are gracious and willing to always step up um, any time of day that folks need um, assistance and we will get super busy um, about this time of year as the temperature drops, which it won't this week, but <laughs> it will happen. Last year we served 264 children. That's a lot of kids. Um, a lot of kids need help. Um, in our school district, we have 88 families that were part of those 264 children. Um, and I would anticipate that we'll see about the same volume this year. So we do take donations. Um, we did some nice partnership with Bertone Bar and Grill, who did a fundraiser for us and um, asked for new boots. That was awesome. We're always in need of new boots. Good things here. Our local retailer um, gathered donations for us. Neighbors Helping Neighbors, which is also another th um, thrift store in, in town. Um, the distinction between us is we don't, our, our families can shop free of charge. Neighbors Helping Neighbors charges a small amount, and all the money that they earn, they give back to the dist or to um, nonprofits in the district and, and, and do that for us, too, so it's a great great uh, partnership. So that's about the closet. Lastly, I wanted to tell you about the Angel Fund. The Angel Fund is another part of the closet. Um, folks in need, which can be anybody in our school district at any point in any walk of life, can contact us. We can help with prescriptions for a student. We have helped save many families from becoming homeless. We partner with the Food Shelf with St. Andrew's Church in helping bridge that gap. Sometimes people find themselves in a month just on you know, unforeseen circumstances. So we've helped a lot of families remain um, in their homes. There's all kinds of great things the Angel Fund is doing. Last year, school year, we um, awarded about $19,000 and helped families um, with their everyday necessities. Lastly, I'd like to invite all of you and the community and the school district staff to attend our gala event on October 12th at Vadnais Heights Commons. It's going to be a great event. We're hoping to have about 300 people this year. It's our 25th anniversary year, so we'd really like everybody to, to come and have a great turnout. Go Bears. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Wilson? Great job of announcing the legacy event, but you never put the time on there. At six and then dinner at seven? Well, Maybe. if you would like to attend our VIP, that starts at five. <laughs> for, <laughs> otherwise, for the general population who isn't a VIP, anybody can join us at five, and then, and then other folks can come at six. So. But dinner is at seven? Or we'd like you there at six. six? We'd, like, <laughs> six. we'd actually like you there at five o'clock. Would be great. We'd like to see everybody come to our VIP. Oh, yeah. And we have <laughs> we have an MC and Gary LaRue will be singing for us. It'll be a great evening. Live auction, silent auction. If you get there early, you get first dibs and yep. all the good stuff. Um, back on uh, the Brochus and the Ryan Grants, do you want to talk about deadlines because they come up very quickly? The Brochus is due, I believe, October 29th. And um, so that's Brocious. Ryan Grant is due um, October, 9th. <coughs> due October 9th. That's the art grant, and Brocious is in the classroom, and that's October 23rd. So they're coming up quickly. Submit your applications now. And this is the beginning of uh, sports and activities. Hansa? The Hansa hmm. is a great opportunity for students who want to participate in a sport may not have the funds to buy all the equipment. We know that many sports are very expensive, whether it be skis or hockey skates, um, and the Hansa provides funds for those people who need, um, need the funds to buy equipment and possibly to enroll um, um, the fee. The, fee the activity fee. Yeah, yeah thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I've got Dr. Michael. 
Do you know <laughs> if this information is disseminated uh, through your school um, building reps at all, or or the principals? Reps, no. no, principals, no. maybe. And, and it comes through with versus uh, news notice. Okay, all right, because it's all of these are great opportunities for the teachers within our district that are you know have great ideas, and we'd like to see them have the opportunity to carry those through. Oh, they're well aware. It, okay. It's, it's Okay, good. Ms. Newmaster. I'll just say I was a happy recipient of a brochure grant a while ago, and it did help me do something in my classroom. It started off our, our uh, listening library um, with uh, the North Campus kids, and it's grown since, but it really gave us a good kickoff and start. And I know we talk about it always the beginning of the school year but I look at the fact that how lovely we have so many new teachers and they probably do need encouragement from their from their mentors just to know that you all are very receptive to great ideas and supportive so thank you for all you do thank, thank you. you it's a great opportunity to um, try something innovative mm -hmm. right Ms. Ellison. Can I just ask a quick question? Where do you accept donations for the closet? Is there a specific time and place? Yeah, we ask that folks give us a call at our office. We're on our website, Wiper Lake Area Educational Foundation, the acronym. So just give us a call and we make arrangements. Sometimes we've picked up from people. A lot of people drop off at the dis district center, but we like to know what's coming in. Good, so, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Newmaster. I know you can also do that at an event and kind of get a list out to people that are coming to a school event because I attended the White Bear Lake retired teachers back to school not picnic on Thursday and our invitation included a list of what was needed and then of course money was accepted so it's always a good thing to mention especially as the seasons change and the kids need boots and mittens and this time we were asked to bring you know new packages of some things Mr. But Wilson and just to close out the closet, <laughs> um, I think it's important because the needs of the students can become so acute, house burns down, they, they need clothes, you know? Or it can be so subtle that it's really tough to pick up on, you know, the fellow students are aware, but the teachers, maybe not so much. Um, I think it's, <clears throat> and because of that range of need there, I, uh, any staff member or faculty member in the district can refer a child and his or her family to the closet. Um, just info, you know, email, what is it? At info? Info WBL. at wiblift.org. Yeah. So just, that's how that one gets carried through, just so you know. And we do have former teachers who can interpret as well, or we've arranged for interpreters if families need oh, interpreters. Yep. Our Spanish liaison. <coughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So there's no real formal application for that. You know, it's just the, someone perceives a need and just forwards it to you. We can make and you take it from there. Yeah. Thank you very much for your work. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to C3, the superintendent's report. Dr. Kasmerich. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Members of the board. We enjoyed welcoming students back for the 2018-19 academic year. Elementary and secondary students began last week, and our early childhood programs begin this week. Throughout the district, there were many excited smiles as young ones entered our front doors after a summer vacation, or in some instances, for the very first time. We wish all of our students a terrific year. Speaking of smiles, be sure to vote in the Back to School Bears Facebook Challenge, which Marissa mentioned earlier. Find the album of smiling students and community photos on the district's Facebook page. That's www.facebook.com slash ISD624. Vote on your favorite picture by noon on Wednesday, September 12th. The photo that receives the most likes will win a cup and cone treat hand delivered by Bear. In addition to our weekly e-newsletters and usual information share outs, we invite you to enjoy two 624 inspired initiatives on our district Facebook and Twitter pages. 
Every Friday, the district will post a video update of the week in 62.4 seconds. And every morning, right around 6.24 a.m., we will share district facts on the district's Facebook and Twitter pages. District community members age 65 and older are invited to apply for our Senior Activity Pass, which allows free entry into a variety of activities for entertainment, home athletic contests, concerts, and theater productions, to name a few. For information, call Jody in the superintendent's office at 651-407-7563. Mark your calendars for this year's homecoming week, October 1st through the 6th. A variety of activities are planned for the week, but a few community celebrations to be sure to mark on your calendar include Friday, October 5th, our homecoming parade in downtown White Bear Lake begins at 3 o'clock. And then the homecoming football game is at South Campus that evening at 7 o'clock. And on Saturday, October 6th, the homecoming Bear Power 6.24K Family Fun Run and Walk at South Campus. That begins at 9.30 a.m. This fall, each individual school will embark on their own strategic conversations. Staff, families, and community <coughs> members are welcomed into the discussion as these voices are vital to the important conversations that will be taking place during this process. Look for additional information to be coming from each of our schools. And finally, another important initiative this year is our comprehensive facilities planning process, which we'll discuss later in tonight's meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to D1, which is our first discussion item, which is the 2018-2019 School Board Administrative Administration Policies. Dr. Kazbicek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marlin, members of the board. So the 2018-19 school board and administrative priorities, um, just, to, um, just to touch on um, four specific things, and then I'm gonna just highlight um, the eight strategies. I'm not gonna go through, go through each uh, action that's gonna take place within um, the strategy, but I am gonna mention the strategies. So for the coming year, um, Again, we'll learn more about the comprehensive facility spending process here shortly, but that's a, that's a primary focus for the coming year. Additionally, elementary specialist program review will take place, a middle school program review, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the completion of site level plans that align with the district strategic plan. Our um, priorities also include um, actions under these different um, strategies. Our, our, our strategies include we will ensure that each student is the primary agent in their learning. We will provide expanding access to a broad range of opportunities for all students. We will foster community engagement and partnerships. We will build organizational capacity. We will embrace all cultures with humility and respect. We will ensure learning environments enhance students' educational experience. We will engage families as partners in the education of their children, and we will ensure the social and emotional growth of our students. So we look forward to an exciting year, and there will be regular updates back here um, with the board approximately quarterly. We'll, we'll update you as to the progress on, our, uh, on the implementation of our new strategic plan. All right. Questions regarding that? All right. Uh, we will move, we'll move on to D. Two, which is the open enrollment report. Mr. Wald. Good evening, Chair Mullen, members of the board, Dr. Kazmercheck and Ms. Pratt. Um, each year at the end of the first week of school, we provide the board an update on enrollment. Um, it's really just an early look. Our first, uh, we lock in our enrollment October 1. That's where we feel more confident about the numbers. There'll be some, some changes to these numbers over the next month. But we'd like to give you just an early look at where we're at, where we started this week, or the second week of school. So we'll start with uh, elementary. <clears throat> uh, generally, the numbers, the enrollment at our elementary school looks pretty consistent with what we saw last year. Uh, Birch and Matoska saw modest increases, while other elementary schools saw some pretty modest decreases. Um, I think this, the, the, um, the decreases are pretty small, but what, we, what, we, what happened last year was that we had a really big fifth grade class, or fifth grade class moved on to sixth grade. We brought in a kindergarten class that was roughly the same number we had last year, 
but it was smaller than that big fifth grade class. So that explains about half of that decrease of 49 students in our elementary school. Um, Otter Lake had a smaller kindergarten this year. They had 89 students in kindergarten, and they had a bulge last year at 106. Um, Onika, the second grade class, is a smaller group this year, and that's Onika's first group. Uh, their fifth grade class was big, so they, they replaced a big class with a smaller class. Um, Willow had a smaller kindergarten than they did last year as well. So it's a 1.2% decrease at our elementary schools, and we'll see where we're at next week. We had a few more open enrollments today, so we'll see where we are when we, when we come back in October. Um, at the secondary, uh, Sunrise and Central are both up. Central is up considerably. That big fifth grade class that moved on went to our middle schools, and, we, and we're feeling that at our middle schools. What's interesting with Central, you look at their enrollment, the, that top left number, 1,151 students, and you go down to South Campus on that same column, Central actually has more students enrolled this week than South Campus. So they are, and they're filling it at Central Middle School. We actually provided some space from District Center, moved some people around um, to create more space for Central Middle School. North Campus is down just a bit. That was a small ninth grade class that is moving through. That group um, was currently ninth grade, has been a kind of a smaller group moving all the way through. So we felt that and some shifting every year that they moved on. Um, South Campus is up just a bit. And so at the secondary level, we're up 96 students, 2.2%. So combined K-12, we're up a half a percent, up 47 students. This chart looks at enrollment by grade level as well as cohort change. So our first graders last year uh, to second grade this year. So that group is, uh, second grade is that small group that's moving through. They're down five students this year. Kindergarten was at, if you look at first grade, kindergarten was at 684 last year, they're up to 689. So you just see some modest changes um, in those cohorts as they move through. Uh, 12th grade reflects uh, an increase in seniors in our area learning center, as well as kids who were in our 12th grade last year and moved to the transition education center. So 12th grade always has a little bit of a bubble there. Okay. Uh, I also would note if you look at grades um, three through six, really grades K through six, compared with grades seven through 11, you can see that as we graduate classes over the next five years, um, we're going to re be replacing them with bigger classes. So if our kindergarten enrollment continues to come in at around 60, 680, and with the construction occurring in areas of our district, we expect that number is going to be coming in larger than that in future years. But we're going to be graduating smaller classes, and it um, would stand to reason that we'd have classes in the 700 range all the way through our school district. This chart shows our enrollment trends. So if you look at uh, the first 2011 and 2012, and look in the orange, orange box where the red numbers are, you can see we were bleeding a little bit those first couple of years, uh, minus 55 and minus 50. It was in 2013-14 that that trend started to shift, and it's been moving upwards um, rather nicely since then, a um, bit, bit more modestly this year. But we're, we're glad to see that trend. And with the construction on the north end of the district, we expect that to continue and to see larger numbers coming in. One more thing I'll note on this chart is on the 2017-18 column, you can see on September 9th of last year, we had 367 students. That settled into 337 on October 1. So it wouldn't surprise me if at all if that 8,660 um, three students that we have right now in K-12, if that, when we come back in October, if that ticks down just a little bit. There are students or families who uh, moved on to a different community and didn't bother to tell us that, they, that they're moving. So we have them in our books and we're waiting for the students to show up. And so we're tracking those families down right now and determining that they're not coming. So that's why you'll see a little bit of, of a downtick for the October. Our early childhood enrollment um, continues to um, continues to build. Uh, 
especially in their special education areas. Uh, we're seeing significant increase. Early childhood special education, birth to two years old, um, from 66 students in 2015 to 119 students uh, this year. So significant numbers there. These numbers also, I will say, are uh, we have less confidence in these numbers even than we did our other numbers. They just started school today. So while we think we might have um, a bulge of kids coming in, there, there might be some shifting. So we'll find that out. We'll report back to you in October, October board meeting with more numbers. And yeah, that is the opening school enrollment report. Any questions for me on that? Mr. Wilson. Yeah, one, uh, Mr. Wall, did we look at open enrollment numbers yet or don't you bother until after October 1st? Yeah, well, because those are kind of still in pro, we're still processing them, we'll look at that for October. All right. Gavin? Uh, Mr. Walda, if you could just mention what you think the huge, I mean, last year we had such a huge increase, even compared to this year or the year before. And I don't recall what the, what the thought process was in terms well, of why we saw such a huge jump there. Yeah, that, that's a good question. In, um, Predicting enrollment it can be tricky, especially kindergarten, because you're just not sure what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Last year was that unusual year where we saw a big um, turnover on the south end of the school district. Lake Ayers jumping up by 13% in one year on the south end of our school district, where there's little to no construction happening. And so we thought we might see more of that this year, that we'd see more turnover on the, the 60s and 70s ramblers on the south end of town. We just didn't see it this year. <clears throat> yeah, the, the building continues as far as I know up in Hugo too. So well, that's hit a lull too, though. Yeah, there's a there's a yeah. I think there's a bit of a lull. I think the the, the numbers we're looking at the um, the 86, 50 or so that we end up settling in at on October one is is right in line with what we had been projecting. So this is, these are not, these numbers are not surprising to us. Last year we were surprised in a good way. And that, the last year I recall, it, it wasn't like any one particular grade. It was actually spread throughout. And we, we picked up a lot of elementary kids though, you know, um, K through five last year. Um, we just, we didn't see quite that, um, Quite that unexpected increase this year. So this is we're at, and we're on we're on track. And in fact, um, having a year where enrollment ticks up a half a percent, it allows us to catch our breath a bit before before things um, things are happening up north, as you know. Um, so I think these are certainly positive results and are in line with what we've been projecting, what we've been anticipating. So I do know that that building. Um, off of 61 and what is that, 100 and 130th? 130th, that has really started kicked into mm. to overdrive all of a sudden. But there was a lull there for a little while. Yeah. Now that development is starting to pop and the development in Lionel Lakes on the northwest corner of Frenchman Road and 35E, they're planning seven, at least 700 homes in our attendance area. So. Once that starts to go, we're going to see some numbers. And we're going to need to be ready for them. Ms. Pulley. I was just wondering on the, um, the early childhood enrollment, so the, the ECSE, um, do those parents pay for those services, or does that fall under our special education? Because I know like I know my kids or my one child went through the, the ECFE. Special ed. They're covered. On, they're covered. It, it's yeah. under special ed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Are there questions regarding the report? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Wald. We will now move on to D3, which is the summary of the evaluation of the superintendent. Um, at, the, uh, at the work study session on August 27th, we had a closed meeting to evaluate the performance of Superintendent Wayne Kazmierczak per Minnesota statute section 13D.05, uh, subdivision 3A. Tonight at the school board, we will summarize its conclusions uh, regarding the evaluation of the superintendent as required by law. I've asked uh, Vice Chair Kim Chapman to uh, read the summary. Uh, Mr. Chapman. Okay, the, uh, the summary consisted of 10 evaluation questions, and uh, I'm just gonna read those and then uh, what the overall uh, consensus of the board was. 
Superintendent has provided leadership for continuous improvement of student achievement, uh, meets expectations. Superintendent has the ability to plan, implement, and evaluate the district's instructional and assessment program, meets expectations. The superintendent demonstrates effective communication skills, written, verbal, and nonverbal contexts, uh, formal and informal settings, large and small groups, and one-on-one -on -one environments, meets expectations. The superintendent has shown the ability to involve stakeholders, particularly school board personnel, or school personnel and the school board in realizing the district's vision and improved student achievement, meets expectations. The superintendent has demonstrated financial forecasting, planning, cash flow management, account auditing, and monitoring, meets expectations. The superintendent has demonstrated knowledge of school facilities and has developed a process that builds internal and public support for facility needs, meets expectations. Does the superintendent create a confident environment favorable to proactivity, creativity, flexibility, and open to feedback, meets expectations? Does the superintendent motivate and engage the cabinet and leadership team, meets expectations? The superintendent continues to work with the policy committee and cabinet to update and implement school board policies, meets expectations. And finally, has the superintendent kept the school board informed on issues being voted on by the school board, district events, and legal situations, meets expectations? Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. We will now move on to discussion item D4, which is, uh, uh, the school board occasionally takes up uh, different, there's a policy committee that, uh, that reviews the policies every so many years uh, and they bring them forth to the board. Uh, this month we have several policies coming before the board for their first reading. Uh, we will have time to answer questions, ask questions uh, regarding these said policies. Um, so for the first reading of school board policy, Policy 102, the Equal Educational Opportunity. Policy 205, Open Meeting and Closed Meeting. Policy 506, White Bear Lake Area School District Student Discipline Policy. Policy 612.3, Development of Parent and Family Engagement Policy for Title I Programs. Policy 615, Testing Accommodations modification and exemptions for IEPs, policy, or section, no, policy 616, school district system accountability, and policy 618, assessment of student achievement. Those policies are now before the board for the first reading. Are there any questions regarding any of those policies and the changes? The changes have been highlighted inside of the packet um, and would ask there's any questions regarding them. Seeing none, we will bring those policies back for their second reading next month um, and move that through. We will now move on to our first operational item of the e evening, uh, operational item E1, which is the action on the facilities planning committee cha uh, charge statement and application, Mr. Wald. Thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board, Dr. Kazmierczak and Ms. Pratt. Uh, during the past year, we've, operate, we've updated the board on progress toward our comprehensive facility studies. During that time, uh, we've presented information related to current uh, physical conditions of our facilities, our efforts to maintain the air quality at each of our sites. Uh, we've looked at projects and improvements along the way, and most recently, a 10-year demographic study. The next phase of this process is to engage our community and our staff. Tonight I'll explain the process and proposed timeline and ask the board to commission the work of these committees. But first, I want to share the why of why are we doing this work. Um, strategy six, um, well first the comprehensive facilities process is grounded in the work of our strategic plan. Strategy six 
ensure, is to ensure learning environments enhance students' educational experience. Onika Elementary Principal Terry Dahlum, during this past year, led an action team of about 30 staff and community members to examine this. And they looked at it really from the outcomes. What are the outcomes we want? They didn't look, they didn't discuss what our buildings should look like. They discussed what the learning environment should look like. What does that space feel like? Um, and so as they were doing that, it became very apparent to them, and maybe not surprisingly so, that our buildings play a big role in what the learning environments feel and look like. And so uh, that team put together six or a series of action steps um, that will help us focus on um, the outcomes that we want within the rest of the strategic plan. Um, over the past uh, 15 years, we've invested modestly in our buildings. Still, as our district and community have changed, uh, we've made adjustments to these buildings. The district maintains over 1.8 million square feet of building space. Um, maintaining that amount of space is a, is a big commitment. But we've also built, a, built along the way. We've we built Onika Elementary and renovations at Hugo. That's um, you know, 15 years ago already that we, went, we, we did that work. Uh, right around that time, a special ed wing was built onto Birch Lake also for our DCD cluster program at Birch. Uh, we've Title IX improvements at our high school sites that consist primarily of locker rooms to make sure that we have equal space for our boys and girls programs, a weight room and a fitness uh, movement space that would provide um, training for both our boys and our girls programs. We improved our elementary schools, uh, several of our elementary schools with gym additions, outdoor renovations, office space at Lake Ayers, Matoska, Willow and Vadness. We improved the community theater here at District Center in 2003 and did significant uh, renovations to our, our performance spaces, our theaters at North Campus and South Campus, and, and we installed synthetic turf at South Campus in 2015. Um, we've utilized multiple methods of uh, financing these. They used to have a program called Alternative Facilities um, Financing, and uh, that is no longer in place. That was re replaced by LTFM funding, which we've presented to you in the past year about. And we use those funds to maintain the HVAC, um, all the deferred maintenance, windows, flooring, roofs, parking lots, um, through our, through our uh, LTFM funds. During that time, 15 years since we built Matoska and uh, renovated Hugo and so many other things, much has changed in our community, much has ch changed in public education. Uh, we're up about 600 students in that time. That's a, that's a lot of bodies and staff to make sure we have adequate space for. All day kindergarten uh, placed a high demand on space. And many districts have struggled with how to meet the needs of all day kindergarten because it about doubled the number of classroom spaces that you needed for kindergarten. Uh, growth of early childhood programming is now seen as a key tool for academic achievement. Um, Mentioned earlier, school readiness plus programs, Title I programs, early childhood Title I, and, uh, and early childhood special ed, and, then, and the growth in those programs. And so that's put quite a crunch on our space. Uh, there are significant new programming needs. We implemented an orchestra program. We have a career pathway program that is growing rapidly, but the amount of space that we um, dedicated to it is limited and so we need to really consider how are we going to build programs when we uh, as we move them forward activity athletic spaces we've added some athletic teams during this time we didn't have a boys swim team if any of you remember when we didn't have a boys swim team we added a boys swim team we've added boys and girls lacrosse that was a club sport for a number of years and now it's a full varsity sport and of course we had a state championship in our boys lacrosse team just a few years ago uh, but they that is a significant demand for field space and we've had some population changes within our district boundaries mentioned last year that Lake Air saw 13 percent growth with some turnover on the south side of town so with these needs in mind uh, we need to we need our f facilities committee needs to consider what a um, what a facilities master plan would look like and what will our school buildings look like over the next 20 years and how will these facilities um, 
serve our master plan, or strategic plan, excuse me. I'd like to talk a little bit about the process. Um, I mentioned, uh, well, we have a facility planning committee. This is a group of district leaders who have been working over the last year to put to get, just to make sure we're, we're thinking and planning in the right direction for our facilities. Uh, we've collected data. Um, we've talked about um, some of those things already, a demographic report, a facilities, um, facility study. Um, and we're going to form three committees. The three committees will be, will be focused on educational programming, community and activities, and the physical conditions and operations of our sites. I'll tell you more about each of those committees in just a few minutes. But the committees will begin their work in October. They'll identify and agree on our needs and report to the facility planning committee. Agreeing on needs might be the easiest thing because when uh, people start identifying what we really need, you can come to an agreement on that. Solutions can get a little bit trickier. But this first phase will be to identify what are we doing, what do we want to do, and what are our needs. Uh, the planning committee then, the, the, the three committees will identify the needs, re bring them back to the facility planning committee, um, who will then present those to the school board in January. <clears throat> Um, I mentioned collecting data. That includes a demographic study. We did phase one and phase two, five-year and ten-year projections. In the first phase, we, we recognized or we looked at the at births and housing trends in the area. The second phase included several significant developments in Hugo that are real game changers uh, for our demographic study. Uh, the physical analysis of our building. Those are the bones of the building. Generally, our buildings are in. They're in generally pretty good shape. We've maintained them well. Um, when we had the facility study, he said most of our buildings would be in the B range. And so they still have work to do, but they're functional and operable and run relatively efficiently. Um, we are just now completing a capacity analysis, how full are our buildings when we consider the programming that we have at our sites, um, how many students can we, can we serve in those sites and still offer the programming that we need? Again, back to um, the full. So again, those though the committee will identify needs, report to the board. Uh, so that bottom report is in January. I went the wrong way. Um, <clears throat> After the board reviews it, and if the board commissions the committees to continue their work, the facilities committees will reconvene in, from February to March. At that time, they'll start identifying solutions and making proposals. Those will be our initial, um, our initial uh, facilities master plan, and the goal will be to, re to bring those to the school board by spring. So that timeline in a, you know, in a timeline format here, just reviewing strategic planning data collection has happened 2017, 2018. In the fall of 2018, uh, the, the three committees, learning spaces, community spaces, and physical conditions will begin their work October 9th. Present that to the board January of 2019. At the board's recommendation, the committees will reconvene their work in February and March and uh, present that master plan to the board in 2019. So I want to talk a little bit about each of the three committees and what kind of work they'll do because uh, we're going to need a um, group of people in our stakeholders in our community to volunteer to be part of these. I want to make sure people understand what each of these committees will work on. So this first one is the Learning Spaces Committee. They'll look at needs related to educational programming. Grade configuration, looking at how our schools are structured. We've had a split campus for about 35 years, and we're going to take a close look at that and decide what our high, what's our ideal high school structure and make recommendations. We're we'll looking at educational programming needs. What are the unique needs at each site? How will our facilities support the implementation of the strategic plan? And so things like um, orchestra implementation, our early childhood needs, extended day needs, um, technology, how will our sites allow us to best utilize technology and in the future, making sure we have the right infrastru infrastructure so that as technology 
um, continues to change, that we're ready to change with it. And then finally, building equity, modernization, branding, making sure that all of our, our facilities are improved and that there's some, they're consistent in their appearance and their feel. The Community Space Committee um, <clears throat> will look at needs beyond the school day. They'll look at our athletic activities and fine arts spaces, um, community education, community partnerships, and our broader community spaces. Our buildings are full all day and they're full of life. That doesn't change necessarily after the bell rings. Our buildings are used um, during the evenings, they're used on the weekends, and so how can our buildings best meet the need, the demand for those sites? And then finally, our physical conditions committee. Um, we've been working on analyzing our sites and looking at, at the mechanical, especially. Um, we have some older mechanical systems that are less efficient than we'd like them to be, so we're taking a close look at them. We'll look at our infrastructure for technology, site capacity, grade configuration. All those things will be part of the physical conditions committee. So if folks want to be a part of, um, part of this process, this will be the application um, process. So each committee, well, applications will go live first thing in the morning, September 11th is when people can start signing up um, to be part of this com these three committees. We'll accept applications through September 24th, and committee members will be notified by October 1st. <coughs> First meeting will be October 9th at South Campus. And then just uh, again, the timeline, um, I won't go over this again, but uh, that's in the notes as well. That's all I have. Okay, we have a recommended action. Uh, excuse me. We have a recommended action. The school board accept administration's recommendation to commission three community and staff committees to identify facilities needs and to make recommendations to the school board for the comprehensive facilities master plan is there a motion to do so so moved a motion by mr chapman is there a second second a second by mr wilson is there any discussion regarding the action Ms. ellison mr wall i just have a quick question how many people do you anticipate being on each of the committees and who will be facilitating each of the three committees thank you for asking that uh so you met our uh, representatives from wold architects and engineering Paul Apikowski and Sal Bagley, and so they're gonna take the lead on facilitating those committees. Um, they have a lot of experience doing so in other school districts, and so we're gonna, we're gonna lean on them to bring their expertise to that. The committees uh, will be about 25 members, up, up to 30. We expect um, anyone can attend the meetings, but only the committee members will be able to participate and, and vote if, if there's a point at which they decide to vote. Um, but they'll be open to the public, and all materials from the committees will be posted on our website. Will there be cabinet members there as well, or will there be any representation from district leadership at the meetings? There will be. Our facilities uh, steering committee will be represented, not necessarily members of the team. For example, Dr. Kazmerchek and I and uh, Sarah Paul, who are working with that facility steering committee, will be at the meetings. We won't necessarily, we won't be participating, but we'll be there to answer questions. We'll be presenting information as the, the committees need it. The first meeting, the first two meetings will really be about um, sharing data with the committees, understanding the work that we've done. You've heard a lot over the, over the past year. You can imagine that committee's gonna need to get up to speed on all that information. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, this will require a roll call vote. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Lloyd? Aye. Okay, we have uh, adopted, uh, adopted the facilities committee charge. Uh, next we'll move on to E2, which is the action on the contract with the construction manager, Krause Anderson Construction, Mr. Wald. Thank you. At our August 13th board meeting, the board was introduced to John Hunink, 
uh, of Krauss Anderson Construction and Brian Hook from Krauss Anderson Construction. And they're serving as owner's representative through the pre-referendum planning process. Um, during this time, they're, they're attending meetings. They'll be at our committee meetings, our three committee meetings, and they'll be listening to the community and getting a clear understanding of what people want for their schools. Uh, they've been involved in all of our facility planning process uh, since we brought them on board. Um, tonight, we're just asking the board to approve the pre-referendum contract. There's no fee associated with the pre-referendum work. Um, so this is a very typical Pre, or pretty tri typical construction manager contract. We asked our attorneys uh, with Rupp Anderson, Squires and Waldsberger to look through the contract. They made some recommendations. We consulted with Krauss Anderson, uh, their attorneys, and we um, came to agreement on, on all things that we felt necessary. But there, was, there were very few things. The, these are pretty standard contracts. Should we engage in construction projects, um, they will, their fee is 2%, again, a, a very standard, standard fee. That's their base fee. So the recommendation tonight is to approve the pre-referendum contract with Cross Anderson. I will also note one, one thing that there is a second contract. So if we were to engage in construction projects, there's a second contract. And Cross Anderson will be our rep during that process when we go to bid for construction firms. <coughs> and and that contract, um, we'll, we'll work that out. We're, we're not in a place to need that contract yet, but before we put anything out to bid, uh, we'll identify or we'll work through that second contract, the A232 contract. So there's a recommended action to approve the contract with construction manager, Krauss Anderson. Construction as recommended by the administration. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Motion by Mr. Wilson, is there a second? Second. A second by Mr. Chapman. Um, under discussion, I have a question. So when you talked about putting things out to bid, that will, that contract, that agreement would come back to the board, correct, before it's let go? Correct. And that would be to engage them as the, still as the construction manager, but also as the bidding agent uh, regarding the projects? Um, well, those, the 232s will be for the construction companies. So they will, we've already agreed that they will represent us through that bidding process. That's okay. part of this agreement. Yep. And Brian Hook is with us tonight. He represents Krauss Anderson. And so any questions you have um, for him, he's certainly willing to answer those as well. Okay. Mr. Wilson? Yeah, my question is really uh, a follow on to Chair Mullins. Uh, the 2% fee, is that going to be fixed uh, based on the initial bid or if costs overrun, is, is that going to escalate to the full amount or do we know? So one of the responsibilities that Krauss Anderson will have is to make sure there aren't overruns. If there are, we'll agree to them. So, nothing, so there, won't be any, there won't be any additional costs unless we agree to them. But the, their 2% will be based on the total cost of the project. The initial bid. Yeah. Okay. No, that would include any. Unless we approve additional right. overruns. Right. Right. What often will happen in a construction project, as I understand it, is um, school personnel will be excited to make an, an addition, and architects will be excited to draft a new addition and construction managers you know kind of play the debbie downers on it and say this is what it's going to cost you <laughs> and so they make sure that that as that starts to build that that there's some realism in the room saying hold on everyone we want to just make sure you're aware of what kind of costs you're talking about as you dream up the second phase of this okay other questions regarding this Mr. Chapman. Yeah, Mr. Wald, um, I just noticed that uh, this particular 2.6.6, .6, which deals with insurance matters, um, the line talking about uh, that the certificates of insurance that the contractor will provide, in this case, Krauss Anderson, will show the owner as an additional insured on the general liability, comprehensive general liability, auto liability, and umbrella and excess policies, that particular line was stricken. 
Um, is this particular contract just, f uh, and you probably spoke to this already, but <coughs> will this particular contract apply to the construction phase as well or not? Uh, well, if we apply move ahead. only to the construction manager, not to the construction companies. And so Carl Sanderson will serve as our representative, okay. but, but this will look different um, as it's bid out. This won't look different. The, con the contract that construction companies will have with the district will look different than this. So they won't be doing any construction for us. They'll be supervising to make sure that the construction companies we ultimately be, um, hire to do the work are doing so as per the, per the bid um, and staying within the agreement. Was this a particular sticking point between the two organizations? No. Because usually when there's a vendor involved in, in something of this nature, and I realize that they're not going to be um, necessarily performing the actual construction, but typically there, there still would be uh, some protection for the owner, in this case the school district, um, so that if Krauss Anderson were to have people on site, for example, and there's a liability situation that occurs as a result of something getting, you know, they you know, spill something, drop something, I mean, nothing related to the construction itself, but still there is a chance of that happening, uh, typically the, there would be some type of protection for the, as far as additional insured, for the owner uh, entity or owner enterprise. And so I was just curious as to why this was stricken. Uh, I'd have to look back at notes to see where we where okay. we came with that. Some of these would are when the um, when the construction manager serves as an owner's rep. Some of the some of the the um, the original part of the AIA contract um, don't apply to construction managers. And so when we look at construction manager as owner rep, it's just a little bit different. And so but I can't answer that question right now, but I can get that answer I have for a, you. I have a question, Tim. Uh, I don't know if this will help, help or not. Our legal counsel reviewed this in depth. Right. Our insurance agent, um, Arthur J. Gallagher, reviewed this in depth. Yeah. And this is what came from them. Yeah. So. I don't know if we can answer your question specifically. We might need to like ask them, but this was reviewed very thoroughly by our legal counsel and by our insurance our representatives. Insurance so Arthur J. Gallagher so they're rec did review yeah. it as well as mm -hmm. because counsel many times will defer on insurance matters yep. to insurance folks. So if Arthur J. Gallagher has, because I know yep. Scott Anderson, I know Jay Squires and whatnot um, uh, from the firm that we're using in this case. Um, yeah, they refer to this contract as the Jay Qu Squires special. <laughs> <laughs> he would be pleased to or I think that. that's a Carl Sanderson <laughs> term for it. Um, okay. But right. so when, uh, when our legal counsel had questions about insurance, they um, defer or referred us to our insurance agent. So then we'd follow up with them and come to an agreement on everything. They were comfortable with it then. Good. Thank you. Okay. We've got a motion. A second, uh, if there's no further discussion, um, we'll just do a roll call vote with this one also. Okay. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Lloyd? Aye. Okay, we are, we will now move on to operational item E3, which is the action on the resolution authorizing issuance of individ in the individual uh, pro proclamation cards. Mr. Wald? Sorry, I'm, I'm... Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'm gonna turn this one over to our Director of Finance, Tom Wazorek. Okay, Mr. Wazorek, thank you. Good evening, Chairman Mullen, Board of Education, and Dr. Kazmachek. Um, for the past few, first, last few years, we've had our uh, P cards, or procurement cards, um, provided by Bank of uh, Montreal directly. Um, when I started, I didn't realize that they were directly, and I thought we were part of the Minnesota School District Liquid Asset Fund P card program. Um, this resolution is going to get the ball rolling for us to be part of the Misloff P card program, where um, we will still be getting our procurement cards from BMO, but we will have access to Misloff's 
um, rebates that are for based on usage. Um, so I'm recommending that we switch over to the uh, Mislav program for our P cards. Okay. There's a recommended action to approve the resolution authorizing issuance of the individual P cards as attached. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Motion by Ms. Ellison. Is there a second? Second. A second by Ms. Beloy. Any discussion regarding the action? So this is just to move the cards over. We're still, everything's still the same. We're just moving to a new format to. Okay. The, the payment arrangements will be the same. They're coming right out of our Mislav account. Um, the, uh, um, I had a thought about it, and I just lost it. But um, the, yeah, it'll be exactly the same, but it's, you know, it's endorsed by MSBA, um, the uh, School Boards Association, and uh, MASA. And MASB have all right. endorsed. And those organizations also receive, um, just from a, from a marketing standpoint, they receive um, revenue as well when districts participate in that program. So it's uh, this predated. The reason we weren't in the in this program prior is that we um, we moved over to MISLAF, the Minnesota School District Liquid Asset Fund, two or three years ago, and the credit cards predated that, so we weren't okay. we didn't participate. So this is a this is a good move. Yep. Yep. It would have been really nice if we could have just taken our existing accounts and switch them over, but um, banking rules don't allow that. So, okay, we've got a motion. We've got a second. Um, any further discussion regarding the matter? Okay, this will require a roll call vote. Chapman, aye. Ellison, aye. Mullen, aye. Newmaster, aye. Wilson, aye. Lloyd, aye. The cards are switched over. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we will get into our last operational item, E4, which is the action on the tentative agreement 2018-2019 contract with Administration uh, Association. And Mr. Cooper. Okay. Good evening again, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Mullen, uh, Board, Dr. Kasmerjack. Uh, the administrative group is uh, housed in the community ed uh, area department. And um, we are uh, pushing for a one-year contract. We uh, discussed it in depth uh, during a closed session the details of the administrative agreement. And uh, the recommendation tonight is to approve the 2018-19 uh, contract for the, the administrative uh, group. Okay, we have a recommended action to approve the proposed 2018-2019 agreement with the Administration Association by passing the following resolution. Marge, you got that resolution? This one right here? Yes, ma'am. Whereas the parties have reached a tentative agreement on the 2018-19 contract, whereas the Administrators Association has ratified the contract, then be it hereby resolved that the School Board Independent School District 624 approves the 2018-2019 agreement and authorizes the chair and clerk to execute the agreement on behalf of the school board. You, oh. sorry. Oh, so what we'll do is, you've heard the resolution. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Motion by Mr. Wilson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Ellison. This will require a roll call vote. Okay. Chapman. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Mullen. Aye. Newmaster, aye. Wilson, aye. Beloyed, aye. The motion passes. We have an agreement. Thank, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. This is the portion of our program, our board meeting, where we have a board forum. So for school board members to bring up anything they'd like, talk about community involvement, uh, anything of that uh, sort. So with that, I will open up for board forum. Mr. Chapman. Yeah, uh, this morning I think all of us uh, at the table here received an invitation from uh, Chris Strife, the um, principal at Willow Lane, regarding a uh, community feast and conversation that is going to be occurring, let's see the date here, I guess Thursday, September 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, uh, community members are invited as well. It's going to be, uh, as, as Chris states here, conversation uh, or it will be hosted uh, as an intentional social interaction event. 
um, to uh, talk about uh, Will Lane and, and uh, uh, various things uh, that are going on there. It's to engage basically the community in, in to become partners in closing all gaps for our students and families. The event's free, children are welcome, and uh, I uh, intend to be there as liaison for Willow and hope my colleagues here are too, so thanks. All right. Ms. Ellison. I wanted to uh, promote a, an event happening with Power Up and Bear Power on Sunday, September 23rd at the White Bear Area Community Garden at the Y. It is a, an event for everybody in the community um, with a free meal that features locally grown food, vegetables prepared by two local chefs um, and other various activities for the community so the meal is free as long as and as long as it lasts so september 23rd at the y anything i you know i just want to add to that uh that i know that school has just started but uh, there's a lot of great athletic activities going on uh several football games swimming i believe tra our track and field uh there's a lot of great things so it encourage community members uh, to please get out and uh, partake in those great events and uh, cheer on the Bears uh, on to victory and uh, go Bears. Um, and with that, I will, excuse me? Win. I know, we've gotten two actually, two great wins in football, so um, <laughs> very excited. So with that, I will, if there's nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, I move to adjourn. I will second that and we are adjourned.